Hey guys, it's your boy Chili. Welcome back to Hardware 3D Tutorial 44. Today, we're going to be looking at a cool visitor-ish probe design, as well as a sexy metaprogramming design that is going to make our dynamic vertex code a lot more concise and flexible. Now just to recap, in the previous video we implemented a basic render queue system, so now we have to rework our existing code to actually use it. Mainly this means as Mainly, this means reworking the ass imp loading stuff, you know, the model, node, mesh stuff. In doing so, we're also finally going to be using stuff like the dynamic vertex buffer and the dynamic constant buffer that we've developed but we haven't fully utilized yet. The end result is going to be a cleaner system for dynamically composing rendering techniques in response to materials loaded with ass imp and dynamically controlling those techniques in a way that scales very nicely. The rework is big, so it's going to span a couple videos. This video is mainly going to cover the probe system for dynamically querying and controlling mesh rendering techniques, plus some enhancements to the dynamic vertex system. The next video is going to cover the implementation of the dynamic technique composition via a new material class, plus some other miscellaneous tweaks and reworks. So here's the git history. These are the commits that we're going to be looking at today, quite a few of them. Let's get started. The first one here, not a big deal. I added some stuff for logging, for performance logging, and I did a few tests, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this again later on when I've done a little more work with the, uh, with the render graph system. But I mean, right now, I just got like a simple performance log that allows us to, you know, take measurements and write them out to a file. It's not a big deal. If you're really interested, you can look at the source code. You should be able to figure out how it works without me having to hold your hand through the whole process. It's not important. What is important here is the, the technique probe. So this is basically the, uh, the visitor pattern that I was talking about. It's something that I've been wanting to implement for a while and it's going to tie in really nicely with the dynamic constant buffer work that we've already done. So I mean, current system, you know, we've got a model and uh, it has nodes, right? And those nodes can have other nodes and those nodes might have meshes attached to them. So let's just say, you know, these square things are mesh instances and, you know, maybe instances of these meshes are attached to different nodes. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, but what does matter is now let's say we want to manipulate some of the, uh, the bindables in these meshes. We want to change parameters, change how the effects look, change the color of an outline, uh, or change the way that uh, textures are sampled, whatever, it doesn't matter. How do we do that? Well, I mean, we might have a class or a function that renders an imGUI window. Uh, so we'll just call this imGUI class. And then that class has to somehow get information out of this whole graph here and access it. So it might, this, this control here, whatever it is, it might only be interested in a specific bindable. Let's say we've got a bindable here. So somehow it's got to be able to access this, but Externally, it only has access to the model classes and the, uh, you know, the, the interfaces that model exposes. So in order to get to here, it's going to have to navigate, query through this graph or this tree, and find meshes or find nodes that is interested in, you know, reading information from, displaying that information, and also controlling. So, I mean, we're going to have to expose interfaces here to navigate this structure and query it. And then once we get to this thing, we are expose interfaces to get a reference to the thing we're interested in. And then from this thing, we have to expose interfaces to control it, to, to get some of its private data so that we can manipulate it. And that's, that's bad for a number of reasons. One of the reasons it's bad is because now this imGUI class, it has a whole bunch of responsibilities. It has to understand the structure of the model in order to navigate it. Model has to expose a whole bunch of stuff that it might not otherwise need to expose. We've got to bloat the interface with a lot more functions. There's just a lot of properties of this design that we don't like. Now let me show you an alternative here. So we give model one function, accept. And what it's going to accept is it's going to accept a probe type. So we've got our probe here, we pass it to the model. And the model, all the nodes, they can also accept probes. So I pass this node the probe, it is going to pass that probe via the accept to its children who are going to pass it down through its children. The probe is going to get passed all the way through the hierarchy 
automatically by the model. The model knows how to navigate itself. It is the uh, it is the master of that information. The, with this design, the probe doesn't need to know anything about how to navigate this tree. The probe just gets passed around passively. And when the probe hits something it's interested in, like let's say it hits, uh, well, it gets passed to this mesh, and then this mesh passes it to all of its bindables. If this is a probe that's interested in bindables, for every bindable that it hits, it is going to get passed in that bindable. And then if it's interested in only a specific bindable, whenever it gets passed into a bindable, it'll check, is this the one I'm interested in? No. Okay, just return. And when it hits the one it's interested in, it's going to get this bindable. It's going to get access directly to this bindable, delivered to its doorstep, and it can operate on that bindable. And it doesn't need to know anything about all of the intermediate nodes. It doesn't need to know anything about this topology. The probe is only responsible for interacting with the thing it's interested in. It gets past that thing, it interacts with it. And we leave the responsibility of traversing the model with the model class. That's the beauty of this. And I, I call it a visitor. I think it's similar to the visitor pattern. I don't think it's exactly the same. Visitor pattern is more about polymorphism and, and this does that but it can also handle this problem of, you know, traversing some kind of topology without requiring expert knowledge about that topology. We leave that in the hands of the topology itself, the model. The probe does its job, the model does its job. We don't have to expose a whole bunch of external functions or external data. It's a really, it's a really beautiful thing. So that being said, how does this look in the code? Well, we've got a base class called Technique Probe. And uh, what it does, a technique will accept a technique probe. And what that technique will then do is it'll pass it down to the steps. And the steps will pass it down to all the different uh, bindables. And any bindables that have a dynamic constant buffer will call visit buffer on this probe, passing them uh, the buffer. And then this probe will be able to, you know, read that buffer decide whether it wants to do something with it, and if so, you know, do some stuff with that buffer. And we also add some context for the probe. So the probe, when we visit a technique, when we get passed into a technique, we're going to set the name of that technique in here. And when we get down to a step, we're going to set, set the name of the step. So when we visit a buffer, we'll have context about what technique and what step that buffer is a part of, and that might help us make decisions. And then if you look at technique.h, it's... Uh, fairly straightforward here. I add the accept. It accepts a probe. It passes that down to all of the steps. And it also sets the technique. So when we accept a probe into a technique, we set that technique and then we pass down. Similarly, for every step, when we accept a probe, we pass it to all the bindables. The base bindable has an accept, but by default, it does nothing. So only bindables that have a dynamic constant buffer are probably the only, they're the only ones that are going to actually do something with this accept. So if we look at constant buffers EX, those are the ones with dynamic constant buffer, we can see here there's an accept here, because as you know, caching pixel constant buffer maintains a constant buffer on the CPU side, so there is definitely something for a probe to interact with, so when we accept the technique probe, we are going to pass our buffer to this probe and allow it to do some work. Now visit buffer returns a bool. That bool signals whether the probe actually changed anything in the buffer. If it signals true, we should set the dirty flag on this uh, bindable so that when we bind it, we also update. So now the question is, how does this actually pan out at the end code? Well, if we look at testcube.cpp, you can see a few changes here. I've replaced this uh, static pixel constant buffer with a dynamic one. And you understand why that is necessary, right? Because when we're doing this uh, probe system, everything has to be dynamic. At least making it dynamic will make the code look a hell of a lot nicer. So if we look down here, test cube spawn control window, what we're doing here now is we are creating a probe based on the technique probe. You can see here when we set the technique, we're outputting some text that uh, basically denotes a new section. So every technique gets its own section in the window and a checkbox to see whether or not the technique is active or not. We don't do anything for the steps, but when we visit a buffer now, we're going to dynamically check for specific keys in the uh, in the buffer structure. So the interesting thing about this, the beautiful thing about this, is it doesn't have to figure out 
which particular buffer it's working with and change its code. It just does it piecemeal. It does it dynamically in, in a dynamically composed way. If it sees a scale, it will put out a uh, control that is good for scales. And it doesn't have to know different static types of different um, you know, constant buffers or different bindables. It just says, do you have this thing in your buffer? If so, here's a control to control it. Now, here's an interesting thing. Dynamic constant buffers originally meant for constants, for pixel shaders, and for vertex shaders. But we can actually use it to control other things with this uh, probe system. So if we go back to transform CBuff scaling, uh, it's, it has to scale the transformation matrix, and it does that on the CPU side. You can see here we're generating the scaling matrix, and we multiply that in before we bind that to the vertex shader. Well, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to create a, uh, a buffer here. Not a constant buffer bindable, just a, a buffer, a dynamic buffer. And we're going to use that to store our scale. And then we're going to make our transform CBuff scaling accept the probe and allow the probe to modify this thing. It's not modifying, we're not using this buffer for a direct 3D constant buffer, just for some CPU side stuff. We're still able to use the technique probe to control that. But yeah, there's the system. You just check four things that you're interested in, in the buffer, and you output controls for those things. Now let's contrast that with what we had before. So if we look at mesh.h from the code we had before, we had this function, control me daddy, and uh, what it would do is it would check for very specific structure types, like uh, this one is pixel shader material, constant, full Monty, all right. And this one is a uh, pixel shader material constant notex. And you'd have to do this if constant expression for every different configuration that you have, which could be hundreds. Where is this control me daddy being called? It's being called right here, right? So we got to call it on one structure. And if that didn't work, then we called on the next one. If that doesn't work, we call on the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. Again, this is dirty, bad but it was the best we could do with our static system. But now that we've got our dynamic constant buffers, we're able to do something like this, works with everything, and it's goddamn amazing. This lambda here, this D-check lambda, it's a neat little solution, checking to see if anything was changed in the constant buffer. So when you call these in GUI functions, they will return true if uh, the control has been moved, if the value has been changed, and this just allows that to be accumulated into one dirty flag which can be returned in a very nice and concise way here. So here we can see our technique probe dynamically picking up on our techniques and on different constant parameters inside those techniques. And it doesn't have to know the specific technique it's dealing with, it just says, oh, here's a technique, here's its name, and here I found some parameters, and here are some controls for those parameters. But we can, uh, well here if we rotate this guy, we can see the specular highlight on that. And now if I run the specular intensity, I can control that. Or I can control the glossiness. It's the same story for the outline here. I mean, I can change the hue of the outline color. I can scale it up and scale it down here. And I can deactivate whole techniques. You can deactivate our standard shading so we only have the outline. Or do it for the outline, just keep the standard shading. So moving onwards, just a little difference here uh, in technique probe. H, I've added indexes for the technique, the step, and the buffer. So whenever you set a new technique, it also will increment that index. It'll give you a unique index that can be used. And it's a better way of giving your controls unique uh, names because each control, its uniqueness is determined by its name. There's a, there's a bunch of ways of doing it, but the name is the most common. But if I have multiple techniques and they, have, they each have their own tech active control, if I just name them all tech active, it's not going to work. They're all going to resolve to the same control. It's one of the downsides of imgui. And you can get around it. It's kind of dirty. But you put this double hash here. This won't appear in the text, the label of the control, but it will contribute to its uniqueness. And before, I was just using the name of the technique, but I decided to go with a unique ID. It's a little safer this way. And I do the same for the controls down here. I generate their, uh, their tag based on the label that I pass in, plus unique ID appended with this hash hash. Just some, just some in GUI bullshit, really.
All right, now we're going to move on to the thing that I've been hinting at for a while, which is dynamically composing our uh, our set of bindables. So we're going to create a class called material, and that's going to directly correspond to the materials that we load via asimp. But so I started the material here, and then I realized to do this dynamic composition, uh, after I load, I get this vertex layout. To decide what data I need to load into my vertices, I need to be able to query the dynamic vertex to ask, you know, does it have a 3D position? Does it have a 2D position? Does it have a texture? Etc. Etc. So, I had to upgrade my vertex, dynamic vertex system a little bit, and I also upgraded it by putting in the X macro system into here as well. So you can see we got X macros in here, and that, uh, you know, we had a few things related to X macros, default map case that just defaults to things like invalid this bridge is kind of important i'll talk about it in a second um, but yeah down here here's the has checks to see if the layout has a particular element this is just for the bridge and then if we go into vertex.cpp uh, we can see a whole bunch of this uh, case switch cases have been replaced by using map and that is aided by the x macro stuff so we can replace a whole bunch of long code with code that is shorter. And that's beautiful. All right, so the only thing here that's a little tricky is the bridge. And the bridge is a little clever way of me bridging between the worlds of static type and, you know, dynamic runtime value. What it allows you to do is it allows you to pass it a class F, basically a functor, function class F, that is templated on an element type and it will call it with the correct static type given a dynamic type so we can we can bridge the world between having at runtime knowing what our type is and being able to statically call the uh the correct f templated on the correct static type so obviously to do that you need a switch and so we leverage our x macro expand switch cases for every single type of uh, vertex layout element and when we get a case of element type let's say position 2d then we template f on position 2d and we execute whatever function it has and we see here that the bridge it not only takes the the runtime type it also takes other arguments and those arguments are just forwarded to this function here this functor so we have this templated functor, and we can execute it with the correct static type of whatever dynamic type we're dealing with. And that's why I call it the bridge. It bridges the world between runtime and compile time. And why we want to do this is because at compile time, we can take advantage of our maps that have a whole bunch of information, but that can only be accessed statically. And this bridge makes it so that we don't have to keep repeating the switch every time we want to access some data from our maps. We have one bridge function, so we can just create these different functors f that do actions. So you can see that in action here. We had our function set attribute by index, and so we had to have a switch that got the, the runtime type and then did, a, did the switch so that we know which one we're dealing with, and then we can do some static stuff. So if we're dealing with a float three color, then we're going to call set attribute templated on that static type. And bridge lets us do that in three lines of code instead of in, you know, however many codes, lines of code this is. But we need the functor. So that's attribute setting functor. And that's just up here. It's templated on the element type, as all of these guys are going to be. And when you execute, it's going to take in two additional parameters, pointer to a vertex, a three parameters, pointer to a vertex, pointer to attribute, and then the value, which is some, some type T here. And then it calls set attribute templated on the static type with these parameters. So it's this plus this, and you can replace this. And the beauty of this is this doesn't get longer as you add more attribute types. If I were to double the number of attribute types, this switch would become twice as long, but this code stays exactly the same length and doesn't need to be modified. So whenever I add or remove attributes, this code does not need to be updated. And that's generally a property that you want for your code. And it's the same deal here. Size of an element is executed by bridging with sys size lookup. And sys size lookup, all that does 
is it uh, looks into the map. Here's a code lookup. It also just looks into the map. Here's a desk generate. It generates a D3D input element descriptor element by looking into the map and constructing one. And then again, that's bridge on desk generate. And that will get us our descriptor. So the combination of this bridge idea with our beautiful X macro plus our maps here allow us to write some pretty goddamn swank code. So that's the upgrade of the Vertex system. A uh, little bit of refactoring and adding some functions that we need in order to actually dynamically compose our set of bindables, which are our technique or technique steps. But that dynamic composition is going to have to wait until tomorrow. Yes, I'm leaving you on a cliffhanger. I had to do it to him. The stage is set and in the next video we're actually going to finish the material class so that we can dynamically compose our technique steps based on the different aspects present or absent in a material loaded with asimp. It'll be the culmination of a lot of the subsystems and constructs that we've been building in previous videos and it's going to be pretty dope. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot and I'll see you soon with some more Hardware 3D.